Oh, do you want a letter? <laughs> Make a letter, Maria. Well, guess what? Yeah. We're up in Moore's at the town offices. <laughs> we came back to the scene of the crime. We're at the post office in Moore's. And, you know, this is nostalgia for me because, of course, I grew up with exactly these combinations. And I should remember. I remember my high school locker number, though. 8-28-4. Somewhere there's an old rusting lock that would open up in the bottom of a dump somewhere. But I came here and I said, I wonder if any of these boxes is unlocked. So I grabbed number 62 and it opened up and Carol Netta went and put something in there so we can jump. Get over here. Good morning. We, we did come back to the scene of the crime. Carol, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How we're, are you? I'm just terrific. We're here to learn some more about the history of this area. We were here... Maybe two years ago, maybe three two years three. ago, maybe. <laughs> I think the opening of the office is about three or it's four. It's a while ago. It's a, we liked the building at that time, and we love it now. But we have a connection with these post office boxes because they, for a long time, let us say they languished down in the basement of the former Clinton County Historical Museum at Oak and Court Streets, not far from where I work at the government center. And I regretted the fact that they weren't on proper display. One time I even tried to show them on camera, but that effort was thwarted. And then we were talking with Ken Ray, our dear friend Ken yes, Ray. Yes, he is. Who came up with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photographs of the North Country, and we've been trying to show them and identify them for months. And we've done six, seven, seven programs with Kenneth. And if you think we're finished, you are wrong. We have He's more. He's an amazing man. He's an amazing guy, and he defines volunteerism because mm -hmm. he's been working with them for about 11 years. But we came up here, and we loved what you did here, Thank you, Carol. We, we try to talk a lot about the history of the localities, and this area, Moores, is rich in history. And now to start this whole thing, how, tell me how you ended up with the post office. Well, it wasn't easy. No, actually, it was relatively easy. I did get a phone call from Ken, and he said we have these old post office boxes and panels from presumably Morse Forks. And he should know. He, he should know. He said, I work. know I've visited these post office boxes before. And he said they really belong in Moores and they were in the process of deteriorating down there and they were covered with um, various stages Many things. of <laughs> <laughs> mold and mildew and everything. And they, he and Ralph Rusano, uh, who is now at the Transportation Museum, work there and they were started to clean them up and they did a rel relatively very nice job on them and so he said I think they really belong in Moors would you be able to go down and would you like them first of all and I said oh I was really excited and I get excited about everything that comes yeah, in from Moors and um, so I asked my husband he, with his brand new truck I said would you mind going down oh, in January was that can you take your truck down can you there? use your yeah. new truck and um, so he sort of grumbled at first, but he was very good about it. We went down in January of that same year and a couple of years ago and picked them up and I cleaned them up more and then we framed them in. We had the uh, town highway guys put them up and so they cut a hole in this wall. I thought Jack <laughs> Dragoon was probably going to have a heart attack. This is his brand new building. Cut a hole in the wall and uh, so we could have it flush to make it look more realistic and I thought the uh, highway guys did a nice job. So I sta they, they actually got the, the oak and I stained it to match and hopefully to match pretty close. And so we have these beautiful pieces here that just are just absolutely wonderful. incredible and more. Uh, how much of this is original? This, this middle part is original, right? That's original. What happened, all of these all of these sections are original, um, except probably this piece here, which was, I presume, a window at one time. Right. Someone, unfortunately, took a saw to make a door panel out of this beautiful piece of oak. Yeah. But we left it as it is. We cleaned it. We put on new... Uh, Trim. Tri huh? um, oh, hinges. <laughs> hinges. That too, and yeah. And I cleaned up the... the um, 
the bronze. I thought at first it was brass, but it's really bronze. And the the these window pieces, um, this piece was the original. The other piece had to be fixed. But the stained glass is perfect condition. I know, isn't it lovely? And it's just beautiful. I think they're just beautiful pieces. So I hunted up a couple of photos of the Morris Forks post offices. Oh, and some is. people think, this is the one that is just west. It was west of St. Anne's Church. And this is up on the um, town hall road in Morris Forks. Just so to, which one is these? We're not from? sure. Some people think they remember the pieces from this one, this little little one. And others say, no, I think it came out of the bigger post office in Morris Forks. And you know, it's hard to get photographs from inside a post office because who would take them except for the photographs of people who have been miscreants and arrested and things That's on exactly the wall, right. You know? It's hard to get photographs yeah. of anything on the inside. I'm trying yeah. to find old school pictures and it's very hard to find too. But anyway, so, I love it. It's so tasteful and so nice. And Jack thought you better take one of your walls inside your little museum office and do it. And I said, I can't take this Once face. again, you prevailed. You're, Thank you. You're a feisty lady, Carol <laughs> Neto, I'll tell you that. Thank you. But we, anyway, I thought they were a nice touch here coming into the office. And, um, you know, I just thought they were beautiful pieces to be displayed. So anyway it's a wonderful greeting for people who haven't been here at the morris town hall stop in and have a look at this historical museum uh i've we're, actually we're, expanded out around the corner here too oh the, i know that we're gonna go over there we're gonna check our <laughs> tape and make sure we got everything we're gonna look at this nice plaque look at dedicated to you well and to lois or also and to lois i would sing that dedicate what was that old song dedicated to the one i love oh <laughs> golly gee we're going to continue this great jack historical program huh i said jack dragoon did not sing that song to me he didn't <laughs> i might be able to arrange that with accompaniment if i can find an old fiddle player <laughs> we'll continue this great program and more yeah, I, I decided that I would tell the public that Carol went out in 30-some degree weather this morning with sandals on. Nobody <laughs> ever you so accused much. you of being toasty and warm. <laughs> 30, it was probably freezing here. It was 39 at my house this morning. Can you believe that? And we're recording this on May 11th or 12th, oh. May 12th. Wow. After having almost about 82 degree weather a day or two ago. Now you're in the hall, you turned the corner here, in a manner of speaking. <laughs> I had to uh, spread my collection out because I really had no more room in the inn in my office. So um, I went out here to, this is all one collection of the Boyer from Eva Boyer's Antiques. Uh, her son, I love the way you pronounce it and I have to interrupt what? you because I came Where? up here I everybody pronounces it differently even different members of the family pronounce it differently and that when I well, I remember doing f commercials for what I called where's florist mm -hmm. where's florist and I thought I was correct and I had people old-timers calling me no it's Boyer it's Boyer it's but <laughs> I still continue to say where's I do too <laughs> I'm and with you. This is a wonderful North Country name, and it doesn't matter. I love it. What have we got here? Uh, these are pieces that were sent to me from Florida from Harold Boyer, the son of Charles and Eva Boyer. And uh, Eva was a person who really valued the importance of collecting, and she was an and she dealt in antiques and old dolls and collecting history. So she was a valuable person in Moore's, and. She ran an antique shop. Here's the one of the little signs that she would use when she would go to her antique shows. She would display that. And um, she had a friend who was Myrtle Gettens. And these, um, this is an oil painting. This is a charcoal drawing done in 1830. And this was done for her son's graduation. And uh, not 1830, 1930 and 1932 for her son's Harold's graduation in 1933. But anyway, I thought it was nice to keep the pieces together. This is a beautiful piece of a, with a mirror over here, and it was done with the back, with the uh, reverse painting. Painting was done reverse under glass. Under, it was done from the, on the back side. Yep. And that was done in 1929 and 30. This is a beautiful um, 
federal Nate? style mirror from yeah. around 1820. This is a, a very, very nice collection. I'd love Thank to you. look at old things like this, and I wonder where the doll collection ended up. I have no clue. Ooh, there's a nice doll collection. Uh, let me see. At, at the museum, at the county museum, I the... think there's also a doll museum in Chazy at the Alice T. Minor yeah, Foundation. They have some dolls. Okay. So there are a few dolls around. So this is nice. So pretty soon mm -hmm. you'll have a you'll have a little room on the in the parking <laughs> lot. A little shack back there. Well, uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. Transportation pieces. And this, this is, is from Charles Davison Flower and Feed. I got this during the bicentennial. A gentleman from Morris Forks um, came in and said this was in his garage. Um, would I like it? And I really never refuse anything. So I've, we've got to get this up on the wall. Um, I, I um, can't remember his name at the moment. <laughs> Sorry, I'll bet, I'll, bet, I'll bet you a quarter you find out as soon as this I program will. is there. <laughs> we have a way of doing that because I have no problem exp expressing my ignorance. And so I let it all hang out and people respond and say, what, you know what he was talking about. And that, it's especially of these pictures. People expect that I know Everything. who lived in every house and every piece of history. That's Addie Shields' job. Yeah, right. we'll leave she it to Addie and the other historians. <laughs> so we're going to go inside okay. and take a look at the museum. Yes, we're being sent off in 15 different directions here. <laughs> Where do we go first? What do we talk about first? What do we do here? But we're inside the little museum room, and we were kind of privileged, I think, to be included in the inner circle when plans were being made to add a little museum to the new building here. And Carol once again used this considerable influence of hers to get it this big. <laughs> and it's more than a hole in the wall. You mentioned that phrase outside. It's more than a hole in the wall. It's a delicious room. You wish it were at least 10 times yes, this size. I would really like to spread out. Carol's like Gordy Little. She never turns anything down, and my wife said, oh my God, what are we going to do with that stuff? And I've been corresponding with somebody about stuff, and I was reminded of the George Carlin comedy routine way back when about where am I going to put this stuff? So we're inside, and she's got delicious <laughs> <of> stuff. stuff. <laughs> and Calvin, every time we talk to a historian, he wants to know about Angelville. And he finally thinks he located it on the north end, of the, of the Angelville Road, and you got a map. I have a map. I have a map. A First of all, map. I have an 1856 map that Calvin probably has had access to, and it has Angelville here, and it is down in the um, uh, southeast corner between Moores and Champlain. I have a better map. Well, this is a pretty this is a pretty good map if Calvin can focus on it, and then we'll look at the other one in a moment once he gets this one. And uh, Angelville would be right down in here. Down in that. Oh, this is an old map too. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen this one in a long time. Should we get farther away, or can you get this here? Uh, where'd you say it was, Carol? Down in the way, down in the corner. Down in the corner. Okay. Southeast corner. In the Shazy Champlain. Moore's line. So many of these wonderful communities that are gone now, and if we don't pinpoint them and talk about them and interview the people who remember them, then they're going to be gone forever. Calvin said it's like Pike's cantonment. You know, everybody knew where it was in the 1800s, and now all of a sudden nobody knew anymore, and we started this great search for Pike's cantonment. And uh, Sucker Town's the same way, right? Yeah. And Shazy. Okay. This was a map that was done by an unidentified person, and they basically took it from the 1850 census. And as you can see, Angel Town, Angelville, because of the Angel families that lived there, and they had actually um, a factory. I don't know what the factory was, but there was a John Angel, um, several angels that lived there and they lived on both sides of the road in the proximity of the Neverett farm the uh, Champlain it was right near the Champlain town line so that was where Angelville was and it was named such because of the angel families who lived there 
And it's possible, once again, we always look for assistance from our wonderful viewers who give us information. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've proved it over and over again where people do have information mm -hmm. in their nooks and crannies. Mm -hmm. And if they give Carol, like, oh, do you have a number here at the yes. museum? What yes, I it? do. Uh, 236-7927, extension 108. I'll always be glad. And I have an answering machine, so if I'm not here, um, they can gladly leave a message, and I will always get back to them. That's wonderful. Now, just for those people who may not have seen our previous interviewer interviews, like, give us just a little bit about your personal background to, to lead us up to how where we're standing here today, Carol. Well, I came to Mars in um, 1969 as a, a rookie teacher, um, teaching second grade in Champlain. I taught there three years, and then I had a chance to move over to Mars to take a fourth grade position. And... I, when I got over here, there was no room in the inn because of the uh, centralization in the district, and so we, I went up to Moore's Forks and taught up there for a year, and it was a wonderful experience. Then I came down to the main building, and I put in 33 years of teaching. I retired three years ago, and in the process for the last 14 or 15 years, I've been doing historian work after school, before school, on weekends, vacations. So I love my job here and um, it really fell into place nicely because fourth grade history is New York State history. So I would take the students on field trips and we would do the crayon and paper rubbings of the monuments and the cemeteries and we would do an artifact exhibit and different things like that. Now we have the fourth graders coming over to see me over here. So it's still nice. It, yeah, it is nice working with the children and we talk a lot about history on this program and I think it's vital to talk to kids about history so they're able to connect mm -hmm. connect the dots if mm -hmm. you will right that's exactly right uh, I have a, a rug beater and I was showing the students one day the fourth graders I said what do you think this is they said it's a giant fly swatter <laughs> said it'd have to be a very big fly to be hit by this yeah. rug beater and strangely enough even young people like me can remember beating rugs. Wow. In the old days when you take those scatter rugs and the old oriental rugs that mm -hmm. seemed to weigh 9,000 pounds to us five-year-old boy, and we'd drag them outside and just pound on them. You'd the put them over the clothesline? Over or? the clothesline. And away you go. Now most modern clotheslines wouldn't even hold a rug <laughs> that size. All right, let me turn around here a minute because I want to talk about something that I found very interesting. And until Calvin told me about this guy, I didn't know a thing about him, and it's it's a dubious distinction to have the one of the first serial killers from this area to to have performed here. So it's, tell us what you know about this. It's also a little creepy <laughs> to have that distinction. <laughs> Very creepy, but just bizarre enough to to be interesting to me. Tell me about it. Um, about a year ago, I became aware of this man when someone from uh, out of the area called me and said they were reading the book called The Devil in the White City and it was the story of H.H. H. Holmes. He had once lived in Morse Forks under the name of his name was actually Herman Webster Mudgett and Sounds like a made up name. Yeah it? it does. It's almost like too nice yeah. nice isn't it? And he apparently lived in, in Morse Forks with a family called the Hayes. His name was Datus. I want to say Datus Clark, but, uh, but better, I know it wasn't better him. not because I'll be seeing him this afternoon. <laughs> so it was Datus Hayes, and um, he lived with his with that family, and who also had a daughter who was a school teacher. He taught in a school. He had the the job of principal teacher slash principal, and. I know they did have those, but they would have them in a larger school than a one-room school because you would have mostly the young un unmarried girls or whatever as the school teachers in the one-room schoolhouses. So there was a school in Morris Forks, a two-story school, um, that burned around um, in the 1850s. and. Um, no, it wasn't. I'm sorry. It was in the 19, in 1920s. It burned. It was built around in the 1850s, and it was probably there that he taught. It was a two-story school on the Pepper Hill Road, mm -hmm. and 
Um, he was only here for like a year, 85, 80, 1885, 1886. So really there's not any information that I can find at this point. You know, when you're in, school, in an area for one year, you can make yourself pretty hidden if you want to. Oh, yeah. So anyway, we don't have anything really on Herman Webster Mudgett, but people have gone on. He went on actually to uh, Chicago, and in anticipation of the Chicago exhib exhibition of 1893, which was to celebrate uh, Christopher Columbus discovering America, and they had this huge exposition. And he set up a, had a hotel built out there and he did horrible things. He would attract young women and chloroform them or whatever and he would drop them into lie and he would use their skeletons to send to medical schools so he could profit from that. He was a really horrid man. And we have um, a movie producer from London who came over recently and he's doing another story on H.H. H. Holmes so he wanted a little background information and I shared with him some pictures I had um, he wanted to know what life was like here in Moors in the 1800s and so he was able to go away with some information it's kind of neat and Calvin got a chance to interview him and I heard about it and yes he did. you know this is a bandwagon that I'm interested in because it's a it is fascinating mm -hmm. these bizarre little things you read about in uh, in fiction but and who were, who would think that this man would come from thought? a medical? And actually, he had a medical degree supposedly, so he had a lot of medical medical background. And he worked as a pharmacist when he got out in the in the Midwest. And who would have thought he would have come up here, you know, to this little? But there had to be a, a reason. This little border town, whether it was, you know, smuggling body parts or whatever we'll, we'll never know whatever it was but That's he was right. he was uh the, the america's first serial killer harold alfred gave you a, a what is this a dvd yes it the, is a the, dvd uh, documentary that mm -hmm. was done and then there will be a movie another movie coming out too called murder hotel i think yeah. in the end of the summer so very interesting i just an aside but not really an aside because it is a part of history i was fascinated by this by this house that you showed me and we have looked at so many photographs of houses and restaurants and buildings tell me about this house this house is paul vogan's house in moores and if anyone knows paul vogan and then you know moores at all it's the green house on main street it's all one color green with a screened in front porch and this was a picture uh probably around the turn of the century in 1900 a family named wilmer fitch lived there and um this, the picture shows um, a young girl with probably her little girl um, being pulled in a wagon by a dog. By a dog. And there's another little boy in the picture, and the house is just gorgeous. Isn't it's it very pretty. Mm -hmm. Just beautiful. And there are so many of these homes this size and even larger that still exist mm -hmm. in the North Country. And I'm attracted by, by different kinds of architecture. And I'm so glad when these old homes are preserved, aren't you? Yes, I am. Uh, as a matter of fact, Paul Vogan is moving very soon. And um, it's really going to be sad to see him go. But anyway, the house is still, you know, nicely preserved. And hopefully someone will buy up the house and continue to take very good care of it. I love it. You told me that you are, have got a beautiful quilt that will be on display. Yes. Tell me about that. During the bicentennial of last year, um, I thought it would be nice to have something on permanent so that after the festivities were over, we would have something that we could share and something that would be on display for years to come. So I got together with Joanne Trombley from Morris Forks, and she's a quilter from the Log Cabin Quilters, and she got together several, probably a dozen ladies, and I went around taking pictures of some of the various buildings, and the ladies did a, a quilt square. We have 25 squares in the quilt, and they represent the different buildings in Moors, the name of the building, the date it was built underneath. It's gorgeous. And we, I'm still in the process of trying to put things together from the bicentennial for display. And I've had some health problems, so I, things have been backlogged a, l a little bit. But 
Um, we're going to get that quilt up shortly. It's beautiful. We'll prove here, if we haven't proved it many times before, that every area has a delicious history. And sometimes a few individuals, and once in a while, many individuals in the area take enough pride in uncovering, unearthing that history to put together a nice picture for, for those of us who visit Moors, who love this area, who come to the parades every now and again and watch how the people react in this part of the world up here in the northern tier. It's delightful for us to get history and I know it's been a wonderful pursuit for you. I, I just love it. I would, if I could be here every day, all day, I would and I love doing research for people and I do that a lot for you know, people all over the United strangely States. Strangely enough, it's hard to fill in all the blanks, mm -hmm. and nobody knows where did that little piece of history go. Mm -hmm. Some of us are fairly meticulous about uh, making chronicles of our lifetimes mm -hmm. for, our, for our own pleasure, and, and in my case, I have such a terrible memory, I have to write things down so I know what I did in 1952. But many people don't because they live for this moment and, and mm -hmm. this they have no idea what posterity means. So it's difficult. Are there any major pieces of this area's history that you're working on now? Any blanks that you would love to fill in? Well, in conjunction with the Bicentennial, we had another little group. We had some uh, little subgroups that worked during the Bicentennial. And one of the groups was um, working on documenting all of the veterans who are buried in Moors and that's a very it was a very big undertaking it took us a long time we went page by page through the cemetery books we walked every step of the way through all of the um, cemeteries we did as much research as we could we put together a listing of all of the veterans from the Revolutionary War uh, we had Ichabod Bosworth from the Revolutionary War all the way up through the wonderful civil. name <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we have the pl we have them documented by cemeteries, by place in the cemetery, by we have them documented also by the war they were in. So that was a, a big undertaking that is something for the future, you know, or is something that I use now also. But notice the word undertaking. Yeah, undertaking. <laughs> She's still hooked up on homes there, isn't oh. she? <laughs> it's very interesting. I was talking with our dear friend Peg Barkham, who's been on this program almost an untold number of times down through the years. She now lives in senior in a high rise in Plattsburgh, but she was so much involved in Northern Tier history. She called me up yesterday all excited, want, wanted me to meet somebody she had met by the name of Bill Glidden. Oh. <laughs> she said, you know, he knows a lot about the Civil War. And I said, yes, he does. And I have begged him numerous times to get in front of the camera. He will sit and talk to you 17 hours without taking a breath about yes. the Civil War. But I haven't yet forced him to sit down or convinced him to sit down and, and tell his story. She yes. was amazed to find out how many people from Rouse's Point, for example, mm -hmm. served in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So that's the it, it is the wars that mm -hmm. kind of tie together in yes, areas is. history isn't it here? we had about 250 um civil war volunteers yeah that's amazing mm -hmm. now there are many things in this room that i haven't seen before and so you've been busy shuffling and adding and moving and finding places for things what just well, have you uh, seen, Ka have you met Catherine? Uh, I did when I came in. I almost said excuse <laughs> me, but that's the way I am. Well, that's Catherine Chandler. Uh, she was the mother of Charles Chandler, uh, the blind man that most of us can remember walking with his dog Maggie up Route 11. And um, he was in the war, and he became blind from an injury in the war. But his mother went to Boston and had that wedding gown made in 1896 and she married Charles's father Charles Chandler and um, it's just a gorgeous gown it's actually um, it's not holding up terribly well but it you know if you were born in 1896 you probably wouldn't be no, uh, you're, you're right <laughs> <laughs> I saw them interview on television a lady who was hundred and three and she was holding up very very well for somebody who was yes, born in I 1902 yes. uh, for people like me have spent most of his life with a rather 
the, uh, most of his life with a rather opulent waist. Take a look at the little teeny, teeny, tiny waist that this lady My waist was never yeah, that big. Ne never that nor little. Nor was mine except at <laughs> the age of six or eight months, perhaps. <laughs> But anyway, it is beautiful, and it's it a is. nice display. I got the um, the mannequin in the antique mall in Plattsburgh, and um, poor Catherine has no hands, but um, we did the best we could, and I thought she had a beautiful face. So, and it, her body fit the wedding gown, so it's, it's hard to find a full-body mannequin. It's certainly very difficult to walk in this room without <laughs> seeing her there. She greets everyone who comes in. So that's nice. What else have you added since we were here that you can think of? You're, I know people, it's nice when people uh, leave you their collections. Yes, it things. is. I, um, I'm i not sure. I have a, a few new pictures. Uh, we have Elmira Lavalley over here. This, All right, this let's... This is a picture that... Um, it's a very nice picture. Let's just hold this up so Calvin can capture it. Tell me about it. Well, I don't know an awful lot about it. I know she's a relative of Carol Berry, who works here in the town office. Um, she, her name is Elmira Lavalley, and her husband, Freeman Lavalley, is up here on the wall. So I want to put her up there with him. Well, maybe Calvin can see. Can you see him up there, Calvin? Excuse yeah, me. Okay. You've got a nice little corner back here. Yes, I have to make use of all my little corners for some reason. I just got another. Um, I just bought another photo frame, and it's got, it houses about um, 20 photos, and I'm going to be putting photos that I've been collecting in here, so we'll have another nice display. I'm always attracted to photographs, and you know, you wonder you. You see a photograph and you wonder what the personality was mm -hmm. of that person, when they lived. This is Evelyn Ray, who just passed away um, a few years ago, and she would be the aunt of Jack Dragoon. And Jack's wife was very nice to give me Evelyn's uniform. Isn't that neat? So I had a sewing mannequin that I purchased and just happened to fit her body just nicely Isn't also. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was given Evelyn's short history of nursing so it all ties together nicely isn't that wonderful mm -hmm. yeah as we're recording this this i learned yesterday that this is a national nursing home week wow and so you know saluting the, the people who volunteer and who work in nursing homes all over the north mm -hmm. country in this early part of uh May 2005. You do have a quilt here. Yes, this was actually <laughs> from Jack Dragoon also. And um, no one in the family really wanted the quilt. And I think it's because of the black is a, a little formidable for some people. But it's really a gorgeous, a gorgeous quilt. And they would use their pieces of clothing and their dresses. And bl black was very prevalent, you know, back in the 1890s, they had a lot of black. The ladies were black what? And um, so this is a quilt from their family and I was very fortunate to receive this. What an amazing way to recycle, huh? We mm -hmm. don't recycle that much among among cloth and clothing anymore because we're a throwaway. Mm -hmm. We're a throwaway generation, but I, I'm a throwback to an era where everything was recycled and saved. And yes, we have to save that rubber band. You never know when we'll need that rubber band. That's you end exactly up with a right. drawer of 50,000 rubber <laughs> bands and old pens. And But this is a perfect example because when I was a youngster, there were people making quilts everywhere. There were mm -hmm. quilting bees and they would have these giant frames that they would set up and all the women would come together for historic occasions mm -hmm. and just for a Saturday mm -hmm. night mm -hmm. and make quilts and they would also make uh, hooked rugs and braided rugs mm. and uh, I, when you look at some of the old braided rugs and you see you know that that was somebody's undershirt or whatever mm -hmm. it happened to be you know it's amazing how they found the time because everything was done by hand and yeah you know it's so we don't know amazing. who made this except that it uh, might have been a member of his it family. was a member of Jack's family uh-huh and I have a picture here of, uh, speaking of ladies dressed in black, this was a birthday party from the, I don't actually have a date on this, but I believe it was from the um, 1890s. And the ladies were very grim looking. It was a birthday party. They were all dressed in black. Looked more like a mourning ceremony, but that goes to show you how they 
They it did. It says that. on the front steps of Mrs. Horatio Knapp's house. That's right. Wow. And the house is right around the corner from Minette's store. Isn't it's it the red nice house. when people write on things so you know? I mean, there we've seen so many photographs that are in no way identified, and I don't mind telling you I have thousands at my house. No, we don't know that those are all dressed in black. They might be purple and red and green. They're all dark. They're all dark colors. That's all we know. Here's another. This is a lovely picture. This is, they called it an old maid's convention, but it was. <laughs> would that be politically correct these days? <laughs> no. Probably not. No, Lawrence, it would New not York. be. And they were all ladies with their uh, very fashionable ladies with their lovely hats and um, their hairdo. And one show sh is showing a side view so you can see her ringlets. It's a really beautiful picture. Just let me mention a few of the names and some of, the, some of their descendants can be titillated by hearing them. Jenny Humphrey, Lillian Armstrong, Clara Fillmore, Mae Brackman, Hattie Fitch, Burdick, question mark, Hattie Bosworth, Frances Pomeroy, Emma Breedenberg, Jenny Taylor, Elmira Fitch, Louise Brank Brank Brankman, Brankman, yeah, Edith Fitch, Laura Fitch, I look like Myra McCoy, Alice Humphrey, Matt Fitch, Eliza Humphrey Myatt. Those names, aren't yes. they beautiful, yes, huh? Yes, they are. Yeah, the old photographs are are terrific and we and we enjoy those looking at old pictures but you know the historians in these little towns are wonderful uh, resource for people and you've you talked about it before and now you do again because now you become a resource for genealogy don't you yes and you really have to know a little bit about how to get involved in the family history what I've done is uh, I have access to different church records. It's hard to find information back in the 1800s since our town was, um, our town started in 1804, but our records only started in 1885 due to a fire in the town clerk's office in 1877, so all of those records were burned. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have um, Barb Seguin and some other people from the American Canadian Genealogical Society. What a good group. We did a, we did <laughs> yes. a show with them a while ago. Very back. nice people. I belong to that group too, but unfortunately I don't have the time to spend. Um, but anyway, they have done research on different churches, marriages, births, um, burials. So I have access to those records. Some of the, the uh, records have been put out in book form. We ourselves for the Bicentennial. Um, tirelessly copied all of the records oh, come for on. the town of Moore's births, deaths, and marriages. Um, you have got to be the, kidding me. Some of them go back to 1875. So anyway, who, that... Who it, was involved in this little project? <laughs> Barb Sequin and myself copied all of the records and then um, her son worked on putting them on to uh, CD and getting People them printed. have no idea, do they? No idea. It took us from the, the beginning of the summer into the late fall to copy all of the records, some of which had to be copied. Um, Barb did a lot of the copying by hand. So, oh but this is, is very valuable. Everything that was in the vault um, in the books is in here, so it makes it a lot easier. And some people have said, well, gee, I'm not in here, but the fact, <laughs> the fact <laughs> is that if their birth was not registered, um, with the town, you know, we only have what we had access to. So, but anyway, I um, when I do research for anyone, um, I always make other copies of everything, and I put as much as I can into a folder. So I have done around 250, in excess of 250 surnames, and I've cross-indexed um, everything. So I can sometimes pull out easily f when I have a request for the same family name. It makes my life a, l a little easier in the long run. And I have in the process to start collecting family genealogies from the area. Yeah, it's funny. Some families have not traced anything. It's, it has to do with uh, things we mentioned before. Some people just don't see that they have a place in history. Mm -hmm. They don't understand mm -hmm. that the past is important. The future is important, and they don't know what the word posterity means. And it's that's uh, tragically that's true in in my dad's family. Nobody did us, to the best of my knowledge, did a scrap of genealogy. 
And to try to just find anywhere to go past two or three generations mm -hmm. is so very difficult, especially with a fairly common name like Little. So. And people did not talk about it very much no. either, you know. So it makes it very difficult. So I try to feel that I am the, a connector between families of the past and families of the present. And I always go into it with the attitude that if I were the one searching, I would hope that someone could help me like I would help them. So yeah, it works out not, pretty well. And it's not always just a matter of looking in a book somewhere to find your genealogy. You have to do a lot of scrounging. Yes, and individuals can rely on folks yes. like you, but they have to do a lot of mm -hmm. legwork on mm -hmm. their own, mm -hmm. on church records. and. Mm -hmm. And uh, cemeteries and who knows I try where. to do. I've got, you know, I've got cemetery records for the town of Moores. I've got all of the cemeteries who was buried there, thanks to the McClellan brothers. Yeah. Um, and I've tried to uh, accumulate everything I can that would help me in my job, too. So, so is that a, a fairly common thing for somebody to come in and say, Carol, I'm looking for so and so? Yes. I'm looking for so-and-so, what do you have, or can you help me? I have people that have called up from California and New Zealand, and um, especially in the summer when people are on vacation. I have more people coming into the office, but um, a lot of people will say, what do you have on this, or what do you have on that? And so wherever I can, I try to help them, I and I enjoy doing it. I think it's neat. Every time I go over to talk to Addie Shields, there are two or three or four people in there that I've mm -hmm. never met, that she's never met, who just bre Come breezed in. in from British Columbia mm -hmm. or California or Florida or Alaska trying to check on some ancestor, and she's got them pouring over documents <laughs> and corners, and we get involved in the, amazing. the most spirited conversations. And, of course, Addie remembers family histories back for generations she is and so intelligent. She blows me away. She every blows time we me talk. away yeah. also. She, she came up for the bicentennial and she did a like a history on the, you know, the transportation system and on the roads coming up through to Moors and the development of everything. And it was like, wow, you know, I don't know how she can remember everything. She's an amazing lady. It's amazing. And I know it's really fun for you. Do quite a few people give you old books? Um, I have had, um, I have a really nice book here that was given to me by the Orr family and it's a biographical review it's just a gorgeous book from it says actually Samuel Roberts Moore's Forks New York in it but it was from the, the Orr family this is from 1896 and it's Clint, Clinton and Essex County um, leading citizens so we have I don't think I've seen that book you haven't before. no well you have really missed wow, something that's nice. <laughs> and it has a list of no, it's in the back. Oh, the book is really starting to fall apart. It's got a list of, you know, the leading citizens, and uh, I wonder if Little is in here. I doubt if there are any Little. There certainly wasn't. My, my Little family wasn't here, and, and there is Louis Little right Lewis there. Louis Little. Now, is he related? Grandpa, where are you? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Oh, maybe he preceded the, the Littles from the Rochester area. Isn't that amazing? Because there were no Littles living here when I moved here in 1961, and now there are a number in the phone book. He was a contracting mason of Plattsburgh, was born in Montreal, Canada, 1834, son of Noel wow. and Angelique Little. Isn't it amazing? England. Their renegade great-grandson... Gordon uh -oh. Little. There. <laughs> renegade, you got it. Black sheep, renegade. So this is a gorgeous book. Look at those all oh, gold leaf. Oh, gosh, yes. Isn't that pretty? That's nice to get. Those are treasures. Yes, they are. They're, they're, every, of course, I was uh, exchanging email very late last night with Jane Lawless Murphy, who wrote, who wrote a wonderful book called Sugar on Snow. She's a dear friend, a fine entertainer. And, you know, I've written so much about stuff. And she wrote a poem called Fragments about stuff, and it's delicious. And she and my wife are scroungers. When they're walking along, they pick up anything from a broken earring to a $20 bill to a quarter that you and I would step over. And what 
Kay brings all this stuff home, and she loves it. She'll pick up a quarter when it's pitch dark at night, and I, I scratch my head. Jane does the same, but then she makes frames and things out of all these old stuff. And what does your wife do with those things? And there, yeah, well, we have, we used to call them junk drawers, but that may not always be appropriate because those, you should call them treasure drawers. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, if I'm a little short of a topic to write about for the next Sunday, I'll open one of those drawers and count the treasure. <laughs> I'll be watching. But anyway, uh, stuff. And, and do you pick things up when you're walking along? Uh, not usually, no. But, but, you know, some people do. And I wrote a column about digging treasures out of the ground and so on. And she, that's what Jane was responding to in a, in a delicious way. She has a great way with words. We have so Actually, many. one thing I did collect was oh, when we moved into our house on the Tappan Road back in the 70s, I kept finding these big marbles, I don't know if you call them. No kidding. Puckers, or what did you, what was the term back then, those clear? Aggies, or I don't the know. big marbles, yeah. the big ones. Yeah. And I kept finding Aggies. them like all over yeah, the place. Aggies, and so I had a little collection of those. But um, Some of them kind of famous because the Redford glass, the, some of the people when they were making odd things, the glass makers would make marbles and hmm. they're worth a great deal of money. Oh, wow. And yeah, some of those marbles, some of the older marbles, like hmm. old buttons, are now beginning to be worth a lot of dough. Really? Sure. Wow. So you found a few. I right? found a few, but that was basically all, you know, some people find treasure on their property. <laughs> I love marbles. I have a collection of marbles. So people lose their marbles, some people find yeah, them. Yeah, some people That's find right. them. <laughs> Whose marbles did we find today? Our marbles are in an old tin first aid box that probably dates back about 75 or 80 years wow. imagine that so what else let's walk around okay. here you know yeah, i just love to here. love to see your stuff what i've done here these are all the cemetery records that from just the moors cemeteries because i certainly don't have room for all the other towns i would like to have but i don't and i have clyde rabidou's books on the headstone inscriptions which are wonderful he spent a long yes, time he on did. that he's yes, an amazing he guy and he likes to write i haven't talked talked to him very much since he got back from hawaii i just this talked summer. to him last week and yeah, he's yeah. doing really well mm -hmm. i don't know if he's writing anything now did he say no he did yeah. not say okay anyway um i've also collected and all of these have plastic sleeves to make them user friendly. Um, That's important. The senses, I've got the um, 1850 Ellenberg senses, Moore senses, 1851 Odeltown, Quebec, which is north oh, of Russ's Point, yes. 1860 Altona, and then I've got um, 1860 Moore senses, Civil War enrollment, volunteers, regiment. Um, 1870 census. I'm start. I'm you know the census for me are, is very important. So now I have the 1850, um, 60, 70, the 1880. I subscribed recently to Ancestry.com, so I've been able to get the census off, which is you know the census tell a story. You can follow the family up through. Hopefully, if they're in the in the stay in the town, and I have some old Presbyterian church records from 1807 to the 1880s. Oh, that's kind of neat. Yes, it is. And um, marriages, because it's very hard. The Catholic churches have basically, you know, been done for the most part, but the, the Protestant churches we haven't had access to. So, and then I have the 1892 Town of Moore census, and that's important because the 1890 census was destroyed by fire. And, um, so it doesn't exist well, anywhere? Um, bits and pieces. I'm talking about the federal census. Yeah. And um, you can get the 1890 veterans um, list, veterans benefit listings from the uh, census. But the 1890 census on the whole is pretty much deplete depleted um it was mostly burned and you have parts of some um states but it's you can't go and get anything from moore's in 1890 because it's not there so yeah. the 1892 is very valuable to me and i have like a library collection of um different books that pertain to history and this is something i got when i started out uh, it's for beginning historians a handbook but what am I supposed to do? <laughs> oh, boy, yeah. So now I sort of know what I have to do. Uh, yeah. But I have, you know, a lot of uh, books on ca Canadian history and... Um, the Railroad Connection. We're going to be doing a 
program on the history of the Rutland Railroad very soon in this area, and we've talked about some of the books you have mm -hmm. in your collection here. And you I can't talk about history without talking about the railroad here exactly in the Northern right. Tier, especially, can you? I just have a girl who was um, doing a paper on the um, impact of the railroad in Moores, and I've had a uh, college student in the past who's done a paper on that, too, so I've got a couple of little resources. You know, there, there are some angles that even Calvin hasn't thought of, but he, I mean, he keeps coming up with these new angles, like what are we going to do a show on this week? And we have a, I have a, a young friend, Billy Duffany, who's just done a serious paper for graduate work at Plattsburgh State on the history of aviation in this area. Wow. And he just talking with me on the telephone a couple of months ago about things that he uncovered that I didn't know. Names connected with early aviation and so one relative, and I'll tell the story wrong, but I'll tell it the way I want to tell it. No, I think it was his grandfather that read one of the first pilot's license here, and he was flying around to show his family how well he did and crashed into his own house. Oh, my God. That I don't know if he was killed or not, but it's a piece of, <laughs> of Billy Duvney's history, so I have a note on my calendar to call Billy, and maybe we'll talk about what he uncovered. Over here I have newspaper clippings from the basically the eight, uh, 1960s all the way up through to, I keep them keep it current, so all the way up to 2005. We joke a little bit about newspaper clippings and historians, but it's important to, to, to track the history mm -hmm. because the local newspaper is again a chronicle of exactly. your history. And I see exactly. Lois Orr, mm -hmm. who did she, she many, did. many, many. Right, and from Lois I uh, picked up in 89 when I started and continued on through. So, um, you know, they are very valuable and it has not just the obituaries, but what happened in the town. Everything to do with Moores is, is in here. So, and then I have the old yearbooks from the Moore School, and I have a lot of people that do come in and say, gee, do you have a picture? Sometimes people who have, from Canada, who have, have to prove that they were once a resident of the United States, and so they will come in and say, can, do you have a picture of me when I was in the eighth grade or whatever? And I'll try to find their picture in here. And, so to show that they did attend school over here in the United States. People have yearbooks with my pictures in them and I, I didn't even know existed. A friend of mine showed, let me borrow an old yearbook from the from the Brushton High School of way, way, way back when, when I was in a band there. And my school was so small they didn't have a... Have a yearbook? They didn't have a yearbook. Besides, my class was so greedy we spent all the money on a senior trip. <laughs> well, that was yeah, fun. Well, it was fun, and the railroad wrote a letter to the school saying, don't ever, send those kids ever back. send those kids on this railroad again. And I remember the hotel sending a letter to the school saying, don't ever, ever really? bring those kids. And I have been trying all these years to get up the gumption to talk to one of my young high school teachers, then young, recent graduate from school, who now lives in St. Regis Falls. Her name is Rita Trippany, and I think... When we celebrate my 50th school reunion later this month, they will invite her there, and I'll still be embarrassed <laughs> to face her after all Did these Did she go years. on the trip with you? She, yes, was one of the chaperones. Oh, boy. And probably uh, quit the teaching business, right? <laughs> I have you know, no you idea. You know how your memory fades over time? <laughs> she'll probably say you were the uh, best group she ever had. And she'll be lying through her teeth. <laughs> But it'll be fun. It is fun to remember, isn't yes, it? it huh? is. Yes, it is. What else have we got? We here? have over here. I'm coming. Do you know what this is, by the way? Uh, wait a minute. Well, it's don't a, cheat now. No, I know. It's is it a planter? A planter? No, um, it's a rug puller. A rug puller? Mm -hmm. I've never seen one. It almost looks like a yeah. Rug we have puller. a plant. We have two planters. Right planter. Now. Okay. Okay, a rug puller. No, mm -hmm. I've seen modern ones, but certainly nothing it's like a that. Puller. This is a planter. Yep. And this was from 1918. It was used by John Gokey. He was the grandfather of Gabriel Valley. Can you imagine planting by, you know, going like this and the seed would pop out or whatever? Oh, I remember using a corn planter and like here's that another in our one garden. This one is from 1900. It's a potato seed planter. They look like they're both functional. Mm-hmm. I love it. 
come on over here. To okay, my corner let me of the sneak world. in with you, and Calvin can try to look over our shoulders as he moves over. You got some neat stuff. Back this there. is um, a wool blanket that was that was uh, from the made by Olivine Bearer of Morse Forks around 1878, and they actually um, grew their own sheep, and they did it. For, you know, they processed the wool and whatever they had to do. And they sheared the sheep, and this is all done by hand. Can you imagine? Feel of it. Very, very fine weaving, too, isn't mm -hmm. it? Wow. And that's made that, right here in Morris. And Forks. then they finish off the edge, you mm -hmm. see? Isn't that cool? So that was a family that uh, yes, donated? Yes, B A R R O R family. Jills of Bearer family in Morris Forks. This is a nice picture right here. This has. Um, special meaning for me because this was a gypsy. This gentleman right in this picture was a gypsy and he was camped out on our, our property before it became our property on the Tappan Road. Really? And an old lady who lived across the road took, she, when she was a young person, she took the picture and it was just a little tiny picture and I had it blown up, but here's a Maltese dog, a brindle bulldog another little Maltese, and um, he was camped out in our field, and he was a horse trader. But oh, he was a gypsy. That, uh -huh, with a, he's mm -hmm. got his little stove there. Yes, and, he's and his all tent, set, he's he? all set up with some, looks like little clippers or something. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. So we have just, you know, various pictures. I have some beautiful old photo albums that was given to me by the uh, Catherine Watson family, courtesy of Kurt DeLong, and... Um, this little corner is like a home, home area with the. We have an. Um, I see you got a chamber pot. It's important uh, to have one of those. I know, isn't that cute? It's a little child's chamber child's pot. Chamber, chamber pot. I'm sure, you and I wouldn't be able to use this too well, would we, Gordy? Well, <laughs> not in not in front of the camera anyway. <laughs> And a milk can. Yes. It's hard for me to believe that young people don't know what a milk can is, and I have two of them on my front porch. This was an a old ringer from that would attach onto a, a washing machine in the 1890s. Reversible washer board. Mm -hmm. Isn't it's beautiful. That great? It's oh, beautiful. That's great. So a lot of little things that ha had to do with um, households. And um, there's the rug beater we we're talking about. Oh, beater. I've knocked something down here. Oh, photograph. The rug beater slash fly swatter. Yep. Let me just put this picture back. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Isn't that nice? It's beautiful. <laughs> you you sure do pack every I available try. inch I try. of space. This yeah. was a jacket, actually, that I got during the bicentennial. It's very heavy from, um, it was Knapp's. Wow. Um, Kenneth Knapp's jacket. And they found it up in the, in the old barn, the one where the, um, the uh, wind thing was stolen from. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's beautiful. Very heavy, heavy. heavy. You don't heavy. know how that person could end up wearing that, something yeah. so heavy. Here's another nurse's uniform. Um, I have different, uh, this isn't the nurse's uniform, but this is. It was like, a, you know, a working nursing oh, uniform. Calvin, can you get the camera in the corner there to take it? We keep forgetting that the, there it is. I wonder if that was from this area, do you think That so? was Evelyn uh, Ray's also. Oh, it was? Yes, oh, it was. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And these, well, actually, this belonged to um, Myrtle Ellis. Um, she recently died a few years ago at 90, and that was her mother's. This was her mother's cape also. So oh, isn't that neat? It's beautiful. What is that, Stockdale? This w dress was uh, my husband Orville's grandmother's dress, and it, it's made out of um, a silk and wool weave called bombazine. Bombazine is a new mm -hmm. one on me. Yep, bombazine. It's kind of a nice name. Many... Whoa. Many of the the names from this area, and we've done shows about this, have, have changed so considerably down mm -hmm. through the years. It's a it's a genealogist's nightmare mm -hmm. sometimes to trace back to see what the original mm -hmm. name might have been. Well, the material was called bombazine. Yeah. Yeah. But even the uh, even the name Neto has been spelled various ways. Many ways, and and 
if I were to go to Canada, I would be known as Madame Ned Nadeau or Nedo. Yeah. So, and they spelled it N A D E A U there, but it's been spelled many ways, like the Rabidous. Um. <laughs> That's where really, Clyde did a whole book on <laughs> yes. it. <laughs> yes. How many forgot? How many did he have around the? In the sixties. In the sixties. Yes, it was. You know, I can remember as a very young person being attracted to the works of Shakespeare, as many of us were. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading how many different spellings there were just to the name Shakespeare. Oh, really? And that's where I was first attracted to how people change names. Hmm. And even a simple name like Little and Castine have been butchered in so mm -hmm. many different ways. And somewhere we're all connected. The Littles are all connected in the Castines and the, what were they called? Uh, different different spellings of the Castine name. Castine. A-G-N-E and A-I-G-N. Yeah. And Little was what, Petit? Or? Oh, yeah, sure. And Lytle and you name it. We had Boulanger, too, as Baker. Someone asked me, do you have anything on Baker? And I'm going, hmm, Baker, Baker, Baker. I had a hard time to find anything on Baker. And then um, I think it was Barb Seguin in for me. Baker is Boulanger. Boulanger. Prince, uh, that's Francis. right. So I've learned a lot about the name variations, believe me. Yeah, in here, I have a lot of nice little things from Morse. Oh, um, yeah. Some curling yeah. irons that you would stick into your lamps, your um, yep. oil lamps to heat them up. And when they got hot, you would just use them to curl your hair. And I have um, shoe button hooks that were used in the early, um, the late 1800s. This one said patented um, August 15th, 1916. You know, the funny thing is, I saw a woman the other day dressed in some high fashion shoes with buttons. Mm. And I stopped and said, did you get a button hook with those? And she looked at me like I was, hmm, yes I did, why? Oh. See, the more things change, the more they go around again and yes. come back again. So now we have shoes with buttons again. It's amazing. I, I hope fly buttons never come back into the years. <laughs> that was always difficult for me with two left hands. <laughs> anyway. Um, we have some ration, war ration books from George Fitch down here. Those are great. Yes, they are. I have a few of those. Liberty Bonds. Yeah. Discharge from the from the army and an old fishing gear box. I don't know if you've ever seen one like that. Oh, have you? That's neat. A round one, huh? With would you like to take thing? a look at it? Of course I would. Just to say that I did. Now, isn't that the neatest? All soldered together hmm. with little wire hinges. Look at this. Oh. That's what it said. Yep, two layers. Now, I don't think Maybe I've ever seen anything it. quite like that. Mm-hmm. That's, that's really this is neat. This from Clifton Higgins. Originally was owned by, this was from, it said a fishing gear box from the 1930s. Oh, I don't think I've seen one quite like that, but it certainly is interesting. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, these little things spark a lot of memories, even for me in my lifetime. Those curling irons, of course, were in use when I was a little boy. Were they ever used on you? Uh, unfortunately, the neighborhood girls were took great pleasure in, in one time in putting curls in my hair, and then I was the laughing stock of the entire neighborhood. And there are, <laughs> some of those girls are still alive, and I'll never let them forget the chagrin that I suffered as a result of their holding me down and curling my hair. My mother thought it was the funniest thing she ever saw in her life. <laughs> I bet she did. Yeah. Oh, you didn't share her enthusiasm? No, not at all. School desks are nice. Yes, this was just my... Um, I don't know, I had to do something with with school here, so I made a little school corner. Of course you had to do something with <laughs> school here. And I talked to kids about an inkwell. And here is an inkwell in the desk. Yes, that was given to me by Scott Dragoon. Isn't that wonderful? And the interesting part of it is, um, the girl who sat in front of me in a little tiny schoolhouse when I was in second or third, third or fourth grade, all the way up through eighth grade, now 
bizarre things happen. She goes to our church and lives only about a mile away from me. Did you stick her braids in the ear? And she will tell anybody who will listen about how nasty I was sticking her braids in the inkwell in front of me. Her name is Jean Williams. She's a wonderful, sweet lady, and her family lived almost next door to mine in a little place called Messina Center. Hmm. And I've told the story before, but I'll tell it again here because it applies. There's a, we did a series of programs on the radio in one-room schoolhouses identifying a series of old 35-millimeter photographs um, one time. And a family who then worked for New York State Electric and Gas had, had turned a schoolhouse into a home hmm. in Salmon River. And the woman said, the schoolhouse is not a schoolhouse without a desk. And she sent her husband out. To get a desk. On a quest. And she, he has no idea where he found it, neither does she, but she, he brought this old desk, much like this desk, back, and they put it in the hallway in the front. And she was cleaning it off and dusting it and making it look presentable, and she found a little name had been inscribed by some child with a, a compass, you know, the sharpened mm -hmm. the compass we had in mm -hmm. school, and that name was Gordon Little. <gasps> oh, my gosh. So my desk from third grade, or whatever grade it was, ended up from way over in St. Lawrence County, again, a couple of miles as the crow flies from where I live, isn't it? That is those, amazing. But those stories are delicious for wow, me. Wow, that is amazing. So that's my connection with the school desk. Wow. But yes, the, the little the little schoolhouses and those school marms, as they were called, those the mostly single ladies who taught yes. taught school back then and had mm -hmm. to cook the soup for mm -hmm. for lunch and stoke the fires and they didn't they have an a, easy they had a huge influence on our lives and i do i do have some of the old dick and jane books oh, of um, course how could we ever know. forget talk about memories huh mm -hmm. and b books that go back further um the c and say series oh, from 1920 Oh, you know, it's just a little phonics book. Of course. Really nice. That will spark, spark memories for people mm -hmm. who are watching the program. To Willis, huh? From yes, somebody. from Mabel and Uncle somebody. <laughs> yeah, somebody's got crayon marks all over it, as <laughs> is very hap often happened. Records down there. Records? Records behind you? What have you got down here? These records now. Oh, that's going to be Hands Across the Border. <laughs> Look at this. Isn't there a newspaper out called Hands Across the Border, well, too? Well, I'm very familiar with with these people. This is Amy. Um, she was Amy La uh, Norma LaValle. She has a daughter, Amy, who looks much like this, and she's married to Larry Begore. And you can talk about this gentleman. Well, Troy Ferguson was a very good friend of mine who breezed in here with a very good country and western band back in the probably in the mid-1960s, and he performed at various clubs around here for a long time. He mm. had some individuals in his band who were uh, about the most outstanding instrumentalists I can remember. I supported him and followed him like a groupie all over the North Country and then lost track of him toward the end. My life is in chapters. And, is he uh, still alive? If he is, I have no idea where he might be or what he might be, but that, if my wife were to see that photograph, she'd say, oh yeah, because he played in a lot of the local clubs, including the 13 Morgans, the Cadillac Club way back mm -hmm. when, and a lot of the local joints. And where he was originally from, I don't know. Look at Smiley Willette. Smiley Willette. Isn't that great? We have and Smiley Sun. Sunset Ramblers. <laughs> I can remember that on television yeah. in the 50s. Oh, my goodness, mm -hmm. yes. And the Lytle family on Channel 5. Yep. They're great. Randy Willett lives here in Moores. Does he? His son. Yep. Mm -hmm. Those are nice to have. Yes, they are. Huh? His wife, Alfreda's there. Oh, oh, yes, she lives, in, she lives in Sh Champlain. And Roger Sargent and then Roger Bartholomew. Is this yeah. Roger Bartholomew? That's Roger Sargent. Oh, this is Roger Sanchez? Yeah. And that's, and that's Woody Wojcik, I think. <laughs> oh, Calvin, very good. Oh, you're right. Wait, there's no record in there. And there's no there record is, in there. Is, there is. It's in big it's, trouble. It's warped. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, Roger Sargent, 
Woody Wojcik, Bart Bartho Bartho Roger Bartholomew, yeah. and then Smiley and Melody L. And you know records in either one of those? No, I don't have any oh, records. Somebody filched the records. We're going to have to yeah. get copies for Just you. Just got the, uh, I found these up the in the old covers. town hall in Moore's Forks. Yeah, well, they're a piece of history. Yes, because they are. we've had quite a few very good singers and bands and entertainers here down through the years. And some are still performing after all this time. Uh, firefighting. This is uh, all on firefighting. We just got a new nozzle courtesy of the uh, fire department here. Oh, that's cool. And we have a sweatshirt from the ice storm and um, different pieces of a, little pieces of equipment and the extinguishers they would have used. Um, we have some pictures of the auxiliary, the ladies auxiliary from, these were the originals from 1953. We have some names that people would recognize. Wilma Conover, Isabel Forkey, Myrtle Sample, Beulah Hogle, Cecile Lapierre, Julie Leahy, Arlie Longton, Marcella Rabideau, and Marion Dragoon. Well, of course. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't, so. oh, look at this. I wasn't sure there was a book on the history of firefighting. I think mm -hmm. we talked about that at one time. Mm -hmm. I don't know who put it together, though. I'm trying to recall. Clinton County Historical Association. Well, there you go. I'm sure I've talked about it before, but then I forget. Mm -hmm. But that's very nice to have that here, too. Yes, it is. So you have a lot of things. I have a lot of things. I also have postcard, postcard collection, really nice postcards from Moore's and Moore's Forks. Um, sometime, sometimes Moore's Forks seems to be left out of the picture, so I try whenever possible to include... You know, Morris Forks is certainly part of the town of Morris, but... Oh, you got some great postcards. Some really lovely pictures. Oh, wow. The old school, oh, which is now St. Anne's Church Hall. Yep. That's what it looked like when I was the last person there teaching. <laughs> One of the last of the three What teaching. year was that? 1972. Uh, 73. The year of 72-73. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, those are, I've seen a few of these photographs, but most of them I have not. Some of these pictures are actually, I think, in, the, in that collection with Ken Ray down there. Probably. The old depots, Morris Forks. This is oh. the Methodist Church, oh, yeah. Morris Forks. This was St. Anne's Church before it burned and then they rebuilt and looks like this. Oh, we'll yeah. see if we have a picture. I know I have a picture here of Look at that. Can you we, imagine? That would pass today. <laughs> These are all postcards from Oh look at the writing. Very nice. Look at this. Moore's Forks, New York. Can you imagine trying to send something <laughs> to store? To Thanks. Carol Netto, Morse Forks, New York. I have had students who have written to me, oh, Mrs. Carol Netto, Morse, New York. I do get it. But. Well, I just got a long letter from our postmistress yesterday saying, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> Tell your people not to put their physical address down when you have a box number. That's right. You know. And I have seen some Morse Forks, which is, uh, Nettie Rabideau had, her husband had these pictures and um, I, t I had those, someone just enlarged them for me in the computer. This is the town hall. Oh, yes. This is now, so has been sold. This is the house that um, a Levanter man lived in, and that's where there was a murder of uh, the Lamberton boy a few years back in that house. Uh -huh. Some gentlemen from the early 1900s. This is a bridge at the, um, in Moore's Forks at the Four Corners. Oh, yeah. Some of these pictures are just so very light. Yeah. This is the school where we think Herman Webster Mudgett taught in Moore's Forks on the Pepper Hill Road. And you could see that there probably were one, two, three, four, perhaps six or eight classrooms, and so there could have been a need for a teacher slash principal yeah. in that building. 
the old train station in Moore's Forks. Is, is that the one that's being restored? No. No. No, no. no that's in Rouse's Point. Oh, yeah. Morris, right? Morris. <laughs> oh, and Morris. <laughs> that you met the Russ's Point <laughs> station. Uh, Larry Marnes is doing a beautiful job, and that would be a place right, to go. We're, we're going. We're, we got a plan. We're going to do it in the next three weeks, I think. Oh, it's really, he's done a wonderful job in there. I and can't everything. wait. I can't he's wait got to a get in there. Little male mannequin dressed up as a conductor. Oh, really? He's got uh, a lot of things in there that he has collected over the years it's gorgeous talk about a labor of love yes right? and these are all just different homes yeah. Morris works the riverside hotel so anyway it's, gr it's great so people people can come in here carol and and are you how much time are you spending here these days um once summer starts i'll be here um probably from like 10 to 2 in the during the school year I'm here only from three to five so every day but I I do come in on weekends if people call me um, I'm very try to be very accessible or if I know someone is coming um, I try to be here you know when I can I'm sure that every one of these programs engenders some some kind of a reaction even if people aren't from this area we love it. I love it when I'll, somebody will send me an email or call me on the phone. They're visiting this area mm -hmm. for a conference or something. They're in their hotel room trying to find something to watch on television. Mm -hmm. You know how it is these days. And they stop on our local hometown cable channel. And they see Calvin's name or my name. And they call up and say, that what you did is important and wonderful and meaningful to me. And I'm not even from this area. Mm -hmm. So I know it's it's meaningful for people who live here, mm -hmm. especially to hear the names of people they know. That's exactly families, right. Their childhood, and and people like you are enjoy our highest commendations because it's it's your passion for history uh, is, shows up every time we talk to you. <laughs> and I was so delighted when Calvin said, "We're going back to more," <laughs> and it's great to see all the changes that you've made here. Uh, once again, your telephone number for people who'd like to call and either make comments to you, or identify things, or give you a little piece of information that might be helpful. Um, our number here is area code 518-236-5665. No, I'm sorry, that's my home phone number. <laughs> <laughs> they can call there too. 236-7927, extension 108. And you, you say you really don't have anything that, that, that any thing that pops into your mind about that you'd like to add to your collection any kind of or, or genre or, or uh, ideas about things that you'd like I'm to always add. looking for pictures of the old schools we had 25 school districts in the town of Morris and I have pictures of only around five schools and I'm always looking for old school pictures I'm looking for anything to do with the um, the Civil War veterans which is at this point probably hard to come by I'm always looking for things glass pieces that say souvenir of Moore's New York I have a few pieces Bottles. or Moore's Moore's or Moore's Forks or yes Centerville. or Center Centerville yeah. yes Moore's Bo Forks is called Centerville. Were there bottles with Moore's written on them? Um, I have little, um, not so much bottles, but I have like oh, um, yeah. two thick holders or oh, yeah. a little sugar, creamer, whatever. This, this says Souvenir of Moore's New York. Oh, those were a pair, weren't they? Um, were they? they yes. They this says Souvenir of Moore's Forks. Oh, so sometimes the stores, the local stores had um, things like that available That's but they are neat. hard to come by very hard to come by so if somebody has any ideas yes you wouldn't mind would love to donate anything and I would really appreciate it or just come and visit to see what I have and um, just to share in the share in it all um, New York State is basically the only state that has appointed historians in every town so it's people coming from out of state are going wow this is nice that you know you have a place here and we really appreciate it they have historical societies but they don't have town historians so every town in the state of New York has a town historian hopefully <laughs> and you know even though 
the most of you have common goals and aspirations. Everybody's got a different personality, and everybody has a different view about history. Yours is different from somebody else's, and so it's nice for us to visit these towns mm -hmm. and visit the <coughs> historians and see how the collections are going. Mm -hmm. Some are just now getting underway, mm -hmm. and we'd love to encourage that, too. In um, Cherubusco, Diane Legree up there has a... Um, well, their town office is in an old building to begin with, so she has a little office space, and <clears throat> some historians have no office space, and it's really sad. So the towns that do have space for their historians, um, you have to commend them because um, not everyone has a nice office like I have to come to work to. So. That's I really neat. appreciate it. How about letters? Do you have a lot of old letters? I have letters. No, you mean from people back in the yeah, 1800s? Yeah. No, I do not. So that would be something that would be nice. Almost because everybody's got a cache of letters mm -hmm. somewhere. Mm -hmm. And if some of the senior members of their families are <coughs> moving away or moving away, mm -hmm. maybe they would like to donate some of the old letters because that's that would be that wonderful. Sometimes, you know, old uh, mm -hmm. diaries mm -hmm. and, le and, and letters are a good way to trace history. Also, um, letters especially from the boys who were in the war, they Absolutely. really tell a, a wonderful story. I do not have much of anything That's along a delightful that subject all by itself and I plan I, I'm, I do a lot of things at the same time, unfortunately. It's hard for me to focus. But I'm going to do a, a column in the next few weeks about letters to home. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I think I'm going to focus in on V-mail from the Second World War. Some of our viewers will know what that is and some will not. And it was a very unique idea at that time to, to microfilm the letters so they could reduce them in size and then blow them up in a form where parents could read the, the V-mail. Oh. Oh. And we have some of those in our house. And the only reason I was attracted to it is because I was doing some research and saw that there is a whole new thing out on the internet called V-mail, which... Is not what you remember? Not even <laughs> close. And they thought they came up with some new name. You know? <laughs> You'll have to set them straight. Well, so that may not be true. Carol, I want to thank you so much for You're inviting welcome. us here and sharing your 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 tremendous lust for the history of this area with us and with everybody else. It was my pleasure, and you also have a a lust for this too. So well, we do, and and I hope we can. I hope we share that with the with the public and get them interested enough to come here and view it to bring their kids here and inspire mm -hmm. a new generation mm -hmm. and to ask questions, supply so. information. I'll and, do the best I can at answering whenever possible. And, give, and bring you stuff. I would hope so. Bring it on. Or, Orville Netto's wife, Carol, Carol's wife, husband, uh, or husband, or, or Orville, he's still teaching, right? He's retiring at the end of Is um, he really? this school year, yes. Well, you, you both will have a tremendous legacy in this I don't know if your legacy will be the classroom or this <laughs> place. Now you're going to well, have the, the two, the two careers are going to battle out here. That's right. It was time for me to move on, and I moved into this, which was natural for me because I was already doing it when I was teaching, and I would go from one job into this one after school every day. And so now I can spend more time and hopefully do a better job even. Yeah, it's, it's nice to have this kind of a, this kind of a passion because it, f it really does fulfill you, doesn't it? Yes, it does. To be able to find a name for somebody. It makes me feel really good when I can help someone and someone will thank me and say, wow, you you know, did a marvelous thing for me or you helped me so much. Or um, one lady said, you have really changed my life. And um, wow! So I thought. Wow! Well, that's <laughs> that's, what that's I a said. lot of pressure, Carol. <laughs> I know. I you know. may not only get to change <laughs> them, only a few lives, and you. <laughs> I saw a poster behind the mannequin there for the Morris Camp meeting. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. and the Morris Camp meeting is one of the oldest in the nation. I'm sure. Yes, I don't they know just how celebrated far their last year. They celebrated their 100th anniversary. So. Because I remember fond memories of the Morse camp meeting as mm -hmm. a very small child driving mm -hmm. for hours mm -hmm. and hours on the old roads from New York City area mm -hmm. where I lived then to come to the Morse camp meeting. That would be something that perhaps you and Calvin might be able to do this summer when they have a camp meeting because he's been there. Oh, Calvin's you have been there. Oh, well, I don't know if it changed, I don't get I don't know if it changed his life or not, but <laughs> 
Um, it's yeah. beautiful up there. I yeah. went up with a couple of ladies who have a camp up there, and it's just gorgeous. Very and being location. in the tabernacle is, is yeah. puts you fondest, at a sense of peace. fondest memories of my childhood are camp meetings here and in Beacon, New York, and many other places. So I, I like to bring that up once in a while. It's a good way to end Your mother the, was trying to set you straight. Oh, she <laughs> tries so hard. She's up there still trying, but not very successful. Thanks again, You're Carol. very welcome. Have a wonderful day. If anyone watching has comments about this show, uh, good, bad, or indifferent, please contact us. Call Calvin, Hometown Cable. Call me. My number's in the book. Any suggestions about where you'd like to have us go or what programs you'd like to have us do, we're always willing to accept your uh, ideas and do whatever we can to support what's happening here in the North Country. And who knows where we're going to be next time.